Well, today is day 29 of our 31 days in the book of Hebrews, and today we enter into the final chapter of this great book. Uh, but before we jump into God's Word, I just want to throw a word of encouragement out there to you all. If you attend FBCW or if you were looking for a church home, uh, we are planning with a target date of returning to church on June 7th. Uh, when we return to church, it will be a little different. Uh, we'll have probably more services than what we normally do. Uh, we are planning that out right now. The staff are meeting together regularly discussing plans. Uh, we are looking at ways of benefiting and helping your children during that time. We're looking at a bunch of different uh, possibilities. Uh, nothing's set in stone yet. Uh, we want that target date to allow us to, in this season to plan to best prepare for you all. But we sent out yesterday in a church email, and I believe it's also on Facebook as well. Um, if you can't find it, just please text one of the staff members. We'd love to send it to you. We have a survey out now, and we want you to fill out that survey, even if you are coming or not. Um, and you can put that. If you if you do not plan on coming, you can put that. You can write that in there, and you can tell us exactly why. And we we trust that we honor that. We 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 love that you're being careful in this season. But that survey will allow us to best prepare for you when you do return to church. Uh, we are looking at every different possibility. We are we are following every guideline and policy laid out by our West Virginia government and also by uh, the West Virginia Baptist Convention. We're following their wisdom and their guidance. But ultimately, in this season, we are trusting the Lord and His guidance. Uh, we we would love for you all to be back and spend time with you guys. But in all reality, right now, if we rush that, we honestly think that's we honestly would think that that was more for our comfort than your growth. Uh, we care more about your growth than our comfort. Uh, so we want to make sure that when we come back, we're coming back for the right reasons and that we come back ready to go. So please fill out that survey. Uh, please just get a hold of the staff members and share with us your concerns, your thoughts, uh, and your comments. And just please communicate with us so we can best engage with you when we return. In the meantime, continue engaging with us online. Even whenever we come back, we're still going to offer an online service for those of you who cannot physically come to the building. We'll still, we will still have content like this throughout the week that you guys can still engage with us in. So please fill that out and be, be praying for your church leaders. Be praying for your, your staff and your government leaders as well. Uh, these are hard times. These are hard decisions they have to make, and everyone has an opinion on those decisions. Uh, but the only people who have to make the decisions are the ones who have to hear everybody else's opinion. So please just be praying for them and pray that the Lord would give them guidance and wisdom in this season. But today we start chapter 13. We're going to read verses 1 through 8. Uh, previously, in the, in the previous chapter, the, the writer has shown us three different things that we should be looking out for. He, we, we should make sure that we oversee people who make sure that they don't fall away. Fall away from obtaining grace. We should make sure that no bitterness springs up, that no one is sexually immoral or unholy, that we should all strengthen one another. We should all strive for peace with everyone. So he saw those three commands, and we're going to see three more today. Chapter 13 begins a more practical and ethical journey through this text. So join me as we read from verses 1 through 8 today. Let brotherly love continue. Do not neglect to show hospitality to strangers, for thereby some have entertained angels unawares. Remember those who are in prison, as though in prison with them, and those who are mistreated, since you are also in the body. Let marriage be held in honor among all, and let the marriage bed be kept undefiled. For God will judge the sexually immoral and adulterous. Keep your life free from the love of money. And be content with what you have. For he has said, I will never leave you nor forsake you. Since we can confidently say, the Lord is my helper. I will not fear. What can man do to me? Remember your leaders, those who spoke to you the word of God. Consider the outcome of their way of life. And imitate their faith. Jesus Christ is the same yesterday and today and forever. So he starts off the beginning, let brotherly love continue. That's the word phileo, where we get the, where we get the, the city named Philadelphia, the city of brotherly love. The phileo love. Let the brotherly love continue. Not just, but he says not just to your brothers and sisters in Christ, but also do not neglect to show hospitality to strangers. He shows brotherly love, which is easy to do as Christians. It's easy to show love to one another within the churches, within the body. It's easy to show love to fellow believers. And sometimes we neglect strangers. He says here, do not neglect to show hospitality to strangers. And by showing hospitality, we're showing strangerly love. We're showing that brotherly love 
to those strangers and by showing them brotherly love, we are trying to include them in the family. We're trying to extend the love that we that we claim to embrace by God. And we pour it out not only to the ones that believe like us, but we also pour it out to those who do not agree and believe like us. Why? For thereby some have entertained angels unawares. As maybe you have been entertaining angels with your love. Maybe, just maybe you've been tested by the love that you've extended. You go back to Matthew 25 that Jesus says, to, if whatever you've done to the least of these, you've also done to me. That we embrace this love of Christ. We extend it not just to the ones that we agree with, we extend it to everybody. We saw yesterday, we, or two days ago, we strive for peace with everyone, not just the body of Christ. Strive for peace with everyone. Look at verse 13, or verse 3, excuse me. Remember those who are in prison as though in prison with them. And, though, and those who are mistreated since you are also in the body. So remember those who are in prison as though you are in prison with them. Why would we want to uh, love them, those who are, love those who are in prison and love them like we are in prison with them? But if we go back to Hebrews chapter 9 and 10 where we have a great high priest who's able to empathize with us in every single way. Why? Because he came in the form of us, lived a life like us, shared in our life, shared in our suffering, shared in, our, in all the ways that we live. But he did not sin. But he did all that so he could experience humanity. He could experience the, the things that we go through so that he can empathize with us when we are tested and tried in every single way. So therefore, we who would claim to be followers of Christ want to imitate Christ. We've, we, we empathize with prisoners as though we are prisoners as well. In all reality, we are prisoners in this world. We have been prisoned to sin, but now we've been set free and liberated by the love of Christ. So we should understand what it means to be held captive. So we imitate Christ by empathizing with prisoners as though in prison with them. And those who are mistreated since you are also in the body. We also imitate Christ by extending this love to those who have been mistreated, most, most likely referring to these, these Christians who have been persecuted, who have been imprisoned. And we view them as parts of our own body. But not, if he's talking about brotherly love and strangerly love, he's also showing that we should view everybody as parts of the body. Why? Because we are all made in the image of God. To, to deny the love of Christ to another is to strip them of the dignity and value placed upon them when they were made in the image of God. And when we think about that, when we strip somebody of that dignity, when we strip somebody of that value, we see forms of racism, we see forms of bigotry, we see all kinds of hatred. Just look in our world today, there's so many different examples. Look in the news right now. Look at the news that's going on down south. There's there's story after story of people who have been stripped of their dignity. They've been stripped of their value that is that they are made in the image of God. And somebody refuses to accept that. And they perform a crime in that manner. Do not devalue somebody as a child of God. We are all made in the image of God. And we need to empathize with those who are in prison. Empathize with those who are mistreated since we are all in the body. Yes, we are all in the body of Christ. But also we are in the body of people made in the image of God. He moves on to verse 4. Let marriage be held in honor among all. And let the marriage bed be kept undefiled. For God will judge the sexually immoral and adulterous. Let the marriage bed be held in honor among all. Excuse me. Let the marriage be held in honor among all. And let the marriage bed be undefiled. See, even then... Marriage was under attack. Marriage was not held in honor. People were going into multiple marriages. People had multiple wives, multiple husbands. If not even then, they, they, would, they would allow other people into the marriage bed. They would allow other people. They were adulterous people. And we see that still today. Marriage is not held in the same honor that it once was. You know, God designed marriage to be a replication, a, 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 a representation of the marriage between Jesus and his church. One who's always faithful, always pursuing his bride, while yet the bride may not always be loving in return. He keeps pursuing his bride, and it's supposed to be this beautiful unity, this beautiful union, this beautiful display of love. That's what marriage is supposed to be. That despite flaws, despite our problems, despite all this, we still pursue one another. We still extend the perfect love of Christ to one another. We still seek the highest good for the other. Hold marriage in honor. 
not just here in this story, but also just today, hold it in honor. And I know for a lot of you, marriage has been wrecked. The idea of marriage has been wrecked because of the brokenness of this world. But don't discredit what God has given to us. God has given us this beautiful gift, this beautiful gift of marriage, this beautiful gift of love. Hold it in high honor. Why? Because God holds it in high honor. He moves on and said, let the marriage bed be undefiled. In all reality, what he says there is, do not let anyone else into your marriage bed. Don't let anybody else there. That is for you and your spouse. That's for you and who God has called you to spend your life with. Don't let anybody else into it. Another person, another thing, your phone, your, your internet search history where you've gone down the deep dark web, don't let anything else into your bed with your spouse. That's why he says there, for God will judge a sexually immoral. It's not just about adultery. Adultery is so much more than just sleeping with somebody. Adultery is also lusting after somebody. Adultery is so much more than just that. The sexually immoral, that word sexually immoral is, is porneia, where we get the word pornography, which we talked about this yesterday. The sexually immoral is anything outside the confines of marriage. And see, today a lot of people say, well, how far is too far? Well, most likely you've already passed the line if you're asking that question as you try to justify your, your, your own problems. But he says there, God will judge the sexually immoral and the adulterous. And he wants you to realize that just as uh, those who leave and are unfaithful to the faithful groom in God, and when God and Jesus and his church, and Jesus is the groom and Jesus is always faithful to his people, Jesus doesn't want adulterous people in his family, in his, in his marriage. We, he's, he's calling us not to be adulterous people. He's calling us not to be defiled, but to pursue one another, pursue holiness, to call one another to the highest good, to keep the, bear, keep the bed undefiled, and showing us that God will judge the sexually immoral. And again, as we've talked about several times throughout this session, do not cross-examine self-examine. Don't point out everybody else's immorality. Look at your own in this text. Keep your life free from the love of money and be content with what you have. So he's shown us here two things that actually are closely related, sex and money. Why are those closely related? Because those are two things that men have, men and women have a hard time controlling their appetites with. It's true that we, we have a hard time being content in satisfaction. Whether that be sexual satisfaction or material satisfaction. We keep sleeping around trying to find satisfaction or we just keep trying to buy more and more things to find satisfaction. But in both cases, we usually end, up, usually end up feeling empty. What he's showing us here is that we need to be content, not just in our sexual appetite, but in our financial appetite. Here's why. For he has said, I will never leave you nor forsake you. So we can confidently say, the Lord is my helper. I will not fear. What can man do to me? So what he's saying is, you guys are only going to find emptiness in what you seek, whether it be sexual satisfaction or financial satisfaction. But you will always find me when you search me. I will never leave you nor forsake you. I will never leave you empty. I will never leave you looking for more. I'm always enough for you. Nothing else will ever be enough for you. You keep going down that path. But if you continually search after him, have an appetite for the Lord, you will always find satisfaction because he is your helper and he and he will do all that he can for you. He will never leave you nor forsake you. He goes on to verse 7, the third command here. So remember your leaders, those who spoke to you the word of God. Consider the outcome of their way of life and imitate their faith. So he's, showing the, he's saying, look back to those who originally shared the word of God with you. Those apostles, those teachers, those preachers who shared the faith with you. And when you believed, go back and think about their life. He says, consider the outcome of, the, of their way of life. You know, most likely referring to those people probably were martyred. Those people were probably persecuted or imprisoned. But they all received the reward that God promised them because of the way of their life. So he's saying, imitate them. Just as he called us to imitate those people in Hebrews 11, as he called us to imitate Christ, imitate their faith. But ultimately, we look at verse 8. I love verse 8. Jesus Christ, the one who will never leave you nor forsake you, the one who is your helper, he is the same yesterday and today and forever. Jesus Christ does not change. Jesus does not change at the command of cultural norm. Jesus does not change at the at the at your comfort. Jesus does not change at anything. Jesus will always be who he is and will always do what he said he will do. He is the same yesterday, today, and forever. So as we wrap up this section today, as you think about 
your day to day, as you think about your life today, I want you to self examine again, not cross examine, self examine. Ask yourself to look over those three things that he that he showed with us. Do you show brotherly love to all, or do you only show it to the people who think and act like you? Do you show brotherly love to all who are made in the image of God, or only the ones that you, who are made or look like you in your own image? The second, do you hold marriage in high honor, or are you are you succumbing to your sexual appetite and your financial appetite, always looking for satisfaction but always finding empty? Find yourself empty. If you're finding yourself empty, you're looking in the wrong place. Look to the one who will never leave you nor forsake you, who's the same yesterday, today, and forever. And then third, go back. Remember those people who encourage you. Remember those people who are encouraging you now. Is their faith worth imitating? If it is, follow their example, but ultimately look to Jesus, the author and perfecter of your faith. And then walk every day, loving one another, loving God, and being more and more like him.